There are theologians who've argued that, in fact, it's important that theology divorce itself, you might say, from the human mind's aspiration to prove the existence of God using philosophical argument. And the argument here of those theologians, Karl Barth is the most famous representative, is that if you argue for God's existence using philosophy, you risk to build the theological project, the project of thinking about the Holy Trinity and Christ, on a kind of foundation of sand because the human mind is too frail, we have too much incertitude about what we can or cannot prove. It's something of our own human making, not of divine origination. And it's a kind of even epistemological works righteousness where we try to approach God through our own measures and means, not receiving the knowledge of God that's given to us by God himself. Um, in some sense, that seems like a very safe thing to say because you're saying, well, we'll depend upon God for our knowledge of God and will depend upon revelation and not on nature or on the aspirations of fallen human nature. Um, the, the problem with it is that grace presupposes nature, as Aquinas famously says, and so in a certain sense revelation also presupposes a, a potential place of reception within human reason. So for example, say for the sake of argument that the human mind had no natural capacity to think about God. In this case, the revelation of God would be so extrinsic to the human mind, so, you might say, alien or violent, that it would, in effect, disrupt our ordinary human way of thinking and be something adverse to the search for the truth for us to cooperate with revelation. To think about the Holy Trinity would be, in a way, to denature the mind because the mind wouldn't be made or wouldn't be oriented towards thinking about God at all. Uh, so, in fact, there's a strange way in which the radical claim that philosophical knowledge of God is wholly alien to the theological project is deeply secularizing and shares a common premise with those secular naturalists who would argue that the human mind um, really ought not to treat of religious topics or of the consideration of God because God is a figment of the human mind or imagination that is alien to human reason and unuseful for explanation and ultimately illusory. Of course, people who are arguing from the theological vantage point don't believe any of those things, but the fact of the matter is in the terminus they end up in this place that's somewhat similar with regards to their view of human natural capacities. Now, in fact, on a more positive note, if we can have nat natural knowledge of God, let's say for the sake of argument, only after the revelation. I mean, maybe only people who believe in the revelation of God and Christ really start to get the philosophical arguments right. If you want to make that argument, you can. I don't think Aquinas is that pessimistic, but I think he thinks that there have been, as it were, pagans who've made non-trivial discoveries about what God is using natural reason. But it doesn't really matter for the sake of argument. The point is, if in light of revelation we begin to argue philosophically, is that merely for, you might say, apologetic purposes? Is that merely to express an aspect of our nature? It's more than that, actually. It's also one of the fundamental requirements for true cooperation in the whole project of Christian theology. So, for example, say I'm thinking about the biblical revelation that God is one. Um, that's a truth of divine revelation, that the one God and creator of all things has given being to all that is not God through God's own purposeful and wise activity, that God is He who is and has given existence to all else that is. But if I start to think about His unity, is it a physical unity? Is it a quantitative unity? Is God a body? Well, no. Uh, so then what kind of unity are we talking about? What is the nature of His unity? Is it the unity of His wisdom? Is it the unity of His justice? Is it the unity of His goodness? What is his ontological unity? And there you're really starting to use kind of your philosophical capacity to think about God interior to and in the service of theology, subordinated to the truth of revelation. So you might say grace interpolates nature and heals and elevates nature so that we can naturally reflect on God within the theological project. And then if you go further and think about the Holy Trinity, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one in being. Well, what is the unity, again, of the oneness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To what does it pertain when we say that the divine essence or the divine nature that is shared equally and identically by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the one God is unified, that there is one divine essence? 
Is the unity of nature of God like the unity of a tree or the unity of a water molecule or the unity of, um, you know, an animal? Well, it can't be. I mean, it, it may be some ways like, but it is also distinctly unlike and even more unlike than like the unity we find in physical creatures. You know, so the philosopher has a role to play, or you might say the theologian qua philosopher has a role to play in trying to think about the mystery of God. And analogous things could be said in the philosophy of the human person. If we start to think about, for example, the human nature of Christ, Christ has a human intellect, he has a human will, he has passions, he has emotions, he has a physical body, he's capable of suffering, he's capable of sadness or anger, as we see in the Gospels. Does the philo philosophical intelligibility of all that have a role to play in our thinking about the humanity of Christ and how the humanity of Christ in his human life, actions, and sufferings reveals Christ's divine nature? How is his divinity revealed through his humanity? Philosophical analysis of n human nature can help us understand the humanity of Christ in the mystery of the Incarnation, and the understanding of the mystery of Christ's humanity can help us understand the divine identity of Christ and the revelation of his unity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so philosophy plays an integral role within theology. Uh, at the same time, it's a subservient role, and it's a role of subordination, subalternation in a certain way. Subordination is probably the better word. Where the philosophy that we use must be, in a way, um, rightly ordered within and under and subordinate to the truths of Revelation. But that doesn't mean it denatures philosophy. The philosophy of uh, Aquinas is meant to have all its, as it were, rights and privileges as philosophy, from its own first principles to its own native, organic, natural conclusions, in a certain logical independence of theology, even while being able to be subordinated to and at the service, placed at the service of the theological revelation. So it's a really important both and uh, kind of qualification. Philosophy is a science. Philosophy is a science that that can be placed integrally at the service of theology as a higher science that's inclusive without being destructive.